One of the side effects of Magic Hunt with so many keywords over the years is that sometimes a card will be printed with the exact same name as one of those keywords. This, in of itself, isn't all that interesting of a detail. However, there are way more of these cards than you think at first glance, and more than enough that asking the question of which of these cards is the best becomes a compelling one. Today, we're going to be taking a look at these coincidentally named cards and see which of them has had the biggest impact on the game. And starting us off at number 10, we have Repudiate Replicate. This is a split card, meaning that it both looks kind of funky and is two separate spells you can cast from your hand. Repudiate is an instant that costs you two hybrid blue-green mana. It is the effect to counter target activated or triggered ability. Replicate, on the other hand, is a sorcery that costs one, one green and one blue that creates a token that's a copy of target creature you control. This card shares its name with the Replicate ability, an ability that lets you copy a spell when you cast it for each time you pay the Replicate cost. For what it's worth, Replicate is a very powerful mechanic, despite only appearing on a handful of cards. Anyway, like most split spells, this trades efficiency for versatility. Repudiate is more expensive than cards like Stifle that have the exact same effect, and Replicate lacks the same upsides as cards like Crackling Counterpart. Unfortunately, both of these effects are niche enough that Repudiate Replicate hasn't ever really been the best card to play. Stifle is a very niche effect, so niche that the only thing that really makes it worth playing in certain formats is how efficient it is. Paying 2 mana for the effect simply isn't good enough when, for that mana, you could be countering the spell that the ability is coming from in the first place. Clone effects are often worse than they look, and that's including the ones that can copy your opponent's cards. Only being able to copy your own creatures makes the uses of the card even fewer and further between. So, if this card isn't all that good, why is it on this list? Well, because of Cascade Combos. Because it's always Cascade Combos. These decks can't play any cards that cost less than 3 mana that aren't lands. And for the purposes of Cascade, split spells have a mana value equal to the combined mana value of both of the spells. This lets the deck get around its main weakness. Namely, not being able to interact with your opponent before turn 3. This means that Repudiate Replicate has far, far less competition in these decks for interactive spells. Despite this lower competition, it still often gets beaten out by cards like Fire and Ice. The fact Repudiate Replicate is even on this list mostly goes to show how bad the majority of these cards are. And at number 9, we have Suspend. This is an instant with the mana cost of 1 blue. It is the effect to exile a target creature and put two time counters on it. And if it doesn't have Suspend, it gains Suspend. Suspend is the ability it shares its name with, obviously, and if you didn't know, this is an ability that makes it so that while the card is in exile with time counters on it, during its owner's upkeep they remove a time counter from it, and then they cast it without paying the mana value when the last one is removed. Normally, these cards have a cost associated with them that allows you to suspend them in the first place, but Suspend does the exiling for you. Unlike most of the cards of this list, Suspend was made to directly reference the mechanic it was named after, as opposed to just being a happy accident. Suspend is a take on the classic blue removal spell, Unsummon. It temporarily answers a creature for just one mana, which is an incredible asset to have, though its downsides are notable. Unlike bounce spells, your opponent doesn't have to spend any mana to get their creature back, so this is often much worse on tempo than a bounce spell is. The main upside of suspending it instead of bouncing the creature is that they can't recast the card immediately. This is most relevant with cheap creatures like Dragon's Rage Channeler that your opponent would have no problem recasting on their next turn. However, for any threat that requires a large investment like Merktide Regent, you're better off with an Unsummon. Most players have decided to focus their removal on dealing with the largest threats rather than the smallest, leaving Suspend out to dry. That's not to say it sees no play though. It's much more popular in CEDH, the competitive side of Commander. There, waiting two turns to get an important card back, often your Commander, can be backbreaking, much more so than having it bounce to your hand thanks to the high speed of the format. This is made even worse by how combo heavy the format is. Stopping your opponent from comboing with Suspend only to win on your next turn is a lot better of a tempo play. Suspend is made even more attractive by the singleton nature of the format, making it so that players need a lot of cards with similar effects to increase the consistency of their decks. Suspend may not have broken into tournament magic in a big way, but it's at least found something of a home for itself. And at number 8, we have Crime and Punishment. This is yet another split card. Crime is a sorcery for 3, 1 white and 1 black. It is the effect to put target creature or enchantment card in opponent's graveyard onto the field under your control. Punishment is a sorcery for X, 1 black and 1 green. It is the effect to destroy each artifact, creature, and enchantment with a mana value of exactly X. This shares its name with the committing a crime mechanic. You commit a crime when you target an opponent, a permanent they control, or a card in their graveyard, and is used mostly to trigger certain abilities on cards. It is debatable if this qualifies to be on this list, because the term crime is almost always used in the context of committing a crime, 
in the rules text of his cards. But it's already here, and it's too late for anyone to change that. Crime and Punishment wasn't thought of as a particularly good card for most of its lifespan, seeing relatively little plain standard and not breaking into modern. The issue is that a 5-mana reanimation spell that only works on your opponent's graveyard is kind of bad if that's all a card can do, and Punishment was too finicky to rely on for removal. Sure, if your opponent had a ton of 1 or 2 mana cards in play, it could kill all of them for relatively cheap, but this was rather infrequent. So, for years after it was printed, the card languished in bulk bins. This all changed when Urza's Saga was printed. This card is a bit complicated, but basically what it would do is let you make tokens for two turns, and then tutored an artifact that costs exactly zero or one into play before sacrificing itself. Thanks to how strong these tokens are, and just how many good cards there are to tutor off of it, Saga has become a meta-defining card in modern. Part of the reason why is that there just isn't really a way to punish your opponent for playing Saga. At least, there wasn't until people rediscovered Crime and Punishment. You see, cards similar to Punishment, like Gaze of Granite, have a very unfortunate non-land clause that prevents you from actually destroying Saga. However, thanks to Punishment listing every type of card it can destroy, it will still see Urza Saga as an enchantment with a mana value of 0 if you cast it for just 2 mana and destroy it. Not only that, it will also destroy any token they made with the card, and will often destroy what they tutored with Saga if it's already sacrificed itself. While you can easily destroy Saga with cards like Erase, this won't do anything about the tokens it made, which makes trying to destroy Saga with single target removal inadvisable, to put it lightly. This means that Crown and Punishment is the best answer to Saga that decks have access to, which gives it a pretty obvious use in the metagame. Despite this, being locked to two colors does mean it sees less play than you might expect. Still, as long as Saga's around, people will be boarding Crime and Punishment to give them an answer to it. And at number 7, we have Fabricate. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 2 and 1 blue. It is the effect where you search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, and put it into your hand, and then shuffle. Fabricate, as a keyword, makes it so that, when the creature with the ability enters the field, you either make X11 servo artifact creature tokens, or put X plus 1 plus 1 counters on that creature. Anyway, back to the sorcerer we're here to talk about, Fabricate is extremely straightforward. Tutors have always been powerful in magic, and restricted tutors are still very potent. Three mana is the band where they go from being broken to just okay though. The tempo loss becomes enough that only very specific decks are interested in the effect. Unfortunately for Fabricate, it also has fairly stiff competition. Enlightened Tutor can find artifacts in his legal legacy, and in modern, cards like Reshape and War of Invention are slightly more efficient in terms of what they can do. As a result, Fabricate hasn't really seen much play in competitive formats. If you thought to yourself, but it was probably good in Commander, congratulations, you're starting to get how things work around here. Fabricate is something of a staple of the singleton format thanks to a combination of the large deck sizes and artifacts being incredibly broken. Every deck in the format will have good targets for the card, and I do mean every deck, because you at least have your soul ring to tutor out. Of course, that's the absolute worst case. You also have tons of cards like Bolas Citadel, which just wins the game if it resolves, combo pieces like Time Sieve or Kark Clan Ironworks, which can win the game instantly with the right setup, the One Ring, which just wins the game if it resolves, and you get where I'm going with this. Thanks to the high density of powerful combo pieces in the form of artifacts and otherwise very powerful artifacts in the format, Artifact tutoring is especially good in Commander. Blue decks will often play Fabricate even if they aren't artifact focused, which is something they can't do with Reshape or War of Invention, because, critically, they require you to have artifacts in play to really be good. You also won't necessarily be on white, so Enlightened Tutor isn't really a replacement. Fabricate is the most straightforward blue artifact tutor, which is more than enough to make it good. And at number 6, we have Absorb. This is an instant for 1 white and 2 blue. It is the effect where you counter a target spell, then gain 3 life. This shares its name with the Absorb mechanic, which you probably hadn't heard of before because it only appears on one card, Limp Sliver. This mechanic makes it so that any damage that's dealt to the permanent with Absorb is reduced by X, in the case of Sliver, by 1. This is a card from Time Spiral, which had a gimmick of showing off possible futures for magic by printing cards with mechanics not on any other cards. Many of these, such as Absorb, never appeared again, and often for good reason. Anyway, onto the card itself, we've officially passed all the questionable choices who made onto this list mostly by default, and onto the cards that have seen heavy competitive play. Absorb is just a council with the ability to gain 3 life slapped onto it, which is enough to make it one of the best counter spells in every standard it's ever been in. Councils with upsides are more than playable in most standards. And when I say cancel with upside, I mean any upside whatsoever. Whether it be scrying one or just exile the card you counter, 
Most control decks will happily play these cards thanks to their ability to answer any threat your opponent could play. Out of all of the possible upsides, gaining life is one of the best around. This may sound strange to someone who knows enough about magic to know that gaining life usually isn't all that great, but to someone who knows just a little bit more, you'll recognize why this is so important. The point of a control deck is to stall the game long enough that their card advantage and sticky threats can overwhelm your opponent's cheap, efficient threats. In order to do this, they have one very important goal they need to accomplish for most of the game. Don't die. Gaining life is more valuable for control decks than just about any other deck, because they're designed to essentially always win a grind game. All they have to do is actually get there. Obviously, you can't just start playing garbage like Angel's Mercy to just pump your life total up because those cards actually give you a worse late game thanks to being card disadvantage. But tagging life gain onto an already playable spell makes them go from good to incredible. Thanks to this, Absorb is the counterspell of choice for blue-white control every time it's appeared in Standard and is still seen playing Pioneer in control decks. Though it isn't good in modern or any older format because 3 mana counter spells simply aren't playable in those formats anymore. While simple, Absorb does its job so perfectly that you can't really ask for anything else. And at number 5, we have Unearth. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 black. It is the effect where you return target creature card with a mana cost of 3 or less from your graveyard to the battlefield. It also has cycling for 2, meaning you can pay 2 and discard it from your hand to draw a card. This shares a name with the Unearth mechanic which allows you to pay a cost to put the creature with the ability from your graveyard onto the field. It gains haste, and at the end of the turn, or when it leaves the field, you exile the card, and you can only unearth as a sorcery. For what it's worth, unearth is quite a powerful ability, as getting extra value of cards in your graveyard is always really good. That principle also applies to the spell unearth. Getting a 3 mana creature out of your graveyard for just 1 mana is a great rate. The card does have one downside though, as do all the cards that reanimate only smaller creatures which is that it can actually be dead in your hand surprisingly often. Unlike other reanimation spells that are used as part of combos, Unearth is forced to be played more fairly or used in more creative ways, so it's often played in more straightforward decks. Sometimes if you're playing a mid-range or aggro deck with Unearth, you just won't have the targets to reanimate, which can be really rough. This is where the card cycling comes in, and then you replace it with a new card if it doesn't happen to be useful. This has allowed Unearth to be good in a variety of mid-range and aggro decks, but it couldn't completely outrun its heritage as a combo piece. Unearth has seen play as a way to insulate your combos and decks where it can bring back key combo pieces. The main place where it sees playing this fashion is in everyone's favorite budget format, Popper. Here it helps with Combo Goblin thanks to all of their combo pieces meeting Unearth's 3 or less cutoff. The deck tries to combine Putrid Goblin with First Day of Class. The sorcery makes it so that any creature that enters the field for the rest of the turn enter with an extra plus one plus one counter. This will get rid of a putrid goblin's minus one minus one counter from persist, letting you persist to reanimate the goblin as many times as you want. Unearth lets you get your goblin back from the graveyard if it died too much before the combo, or grab another combo piece like Dark Dweller Oracle. Cycling also lets it dig for combo pieces in a pinch if it doesn't have any target to bring back. Unearth is a bit of a niche spell, but having a niche and filling it perfectly is more than enough to make an impact on the competitive metagame. And at number 4, we have Persist. This is a source with the mana cost of 1 and 1 black. It is the effect where you return target non-legendary creature from your graveyard to the battlefield with a minus 1 minus 1 counter on it. It's named directly after the Persist mechanic, which we actually just mentored on Putrid Goblin. For its part, Persist is a pretty broken mechanic. First Day of Class is far from the only way to abuse Persist to get infinite revives. Persist and its sister mechanic, Undying, are both infamous for how easy they are to abuse. Speaking of easy to abuse cards, Persist the Spell is a game winning spell when you cast it. Unlike Unearth, Persist can cheat out huge threats like Archon of Cruelty way ahead of schedule. You can't cheat out the absolute best targets like Grizzlebrand thanks to the non legendary clause but this only takes Persist from being a broken card to being a ludicrously powerful one. Archon's so strong that it instantly wins you in a winning position when it resolves, whereas Grizzlebrand literally wins the game when it resolves. Persist is usually combined with indomitable creativity to cheat cards into play as quickly as possible in modern, which very few decks are able to compete with. The only issue with the card is that it often gets beaten out by more powerful options. In Legacy and Vintage, cards like Oath of Druids or Reanimate are just more efficient than Persist not to mention that they can still hit legendary creatures. In modern, it still has to share the spotlight with creativity, which is ultimately the more important card for the decks Persist is played in. While it may be overshadowed, the number of games won off of Persisting and Archon into play is proof enough of how strong it is. And at number 3, we have Explore. This is a sorcerer with a mana cost of 1 and 1 green, and it has the effect where you can play an extra land this turn, and it draws you a card. This shares a name with the Explore mechanic. 
How the mechanic works is, whenever a creature explores, you reveal the top card of your library. If it's a land, you put it into your hand. Otherwise, you put a plus one plus one counter on the exploring creature, and you either leave the card on top of your deck or mill it. Your choice. Explore is quite a powerful keyword, thanks in no small part due to a number of cards that synergize with Explore in powerful ways. Back to the card named Explore. In most decks, it's a worse rampant growth. If things go well, Explore is completely on par with the card, as it ends with you ramping one land, and, ultimately, you're still in neutral terms of card advantage either way. However, growth always finds a land for you, so it's always live while you have the mana to cast it. However, Explore depends on the cards in your hand, so most players opt to play the more consistent option. The big difference, and what gives Explore the edge that allows it to see more play than growth, is that Explore works with non-basic lands. This means that if you want to cheat a card like Simic Growth Chamber to play, Explore is what you should be going with. Even better, since the bounce lands return a land to your hand, the inconsistency that makes Explore sometimes worse than growth is completely non-existent. Combine this with Amulet of Vigor and Primeval Titan, and you have the basis for a land-based combo deck that's been good since Modern came into existence. Explore is maybe punching above its weight thanks to playing so well with these powerful combo cards, but the flexibility of this card ensures that it would be easy for the card to find a home. And at number 2, we have Channel. This is a sorcery which costs 2 green. It is the effect where, for the rest of the turn, you can pay 1 life to add 1 colorless mana. It shares its name with a channel ability, which allows you to pay a mana cost and discard the card to do something. It depends on the card. Unlike the channel mechanic, which varies in terms of usefulness and power, the spell channel is just always broken. Famously, channel was part of the very first combo in Magic, Channel Fireball. Fireball was a sorcery for X and 1 red that essentially dealt X damage to any target. The idea was to use channel to add 19 colorless mana, then spend all that mana and one extra from somewhere to burn your opponent for 20 before they could even play. Early on in the game's lifespan, before the rules had been standardized and the first ban list had been put into effect, this combo was terrifying thanks to all the fast mana in the formats like Black Lotus. Since then, the card has done very little thanks to being extremely banned in every format. The only place it's legal is in Vintage, where it's restricted to a single copy. With only one channel on your deck, it's really not worth using as part of any combos, as they're simply too inconsistent to rely on. Still, if the card were ever let out of the prison known as a ban list, it would certainly start wreaking havoc on whatever poor format it had been let into. Even if it weren't one of the best decks in the format, it's so easy to find a way to kill your opponent out of nowhere with channel that it would see a ton of play even if just in gimmick decks. Unfortunately, the impact that channel has had on the game is mostly limited to hypotheticals, unlike the number one card on this list. And all the way at number one, we have Flash. This is an instant with a mana cost of one and one blue. It is the effect where you put a creature from your hand onto the field, then you sacrifice it unless you pay its mana cost minus two. Now, take a wild guess what mechanic it shares a name with. The Flash mechanic allows you to cast non-instant spells at instant speed. Flash is always extremely powerful, but it shows up very rarely. As for the actual spell we'll be talking about here, Flash was considered a pretty average card. Using two cards to cast a spell at instant speed just wasn't really worth it. However, people quickly figured out a way to make its downside into an upside once the card Protean Hulk got printed. This is a 7 mana 6-6 six, six of the ability where, whenever it dies, you search your library for any number of creatures with total mana value of 6, put them onto the battlefield, and then shuffle. Being able to tutor out 6 mana worth of creatures at instant speed quickly proved to be extremely broken. Tons of different combos have come and gone with Hulk over the years, from using Karmic Guide and Kiki Jiki Mirror Breaker to reanimate it and tutor it out of your deck, to just grabbing a ton of zero mana creatures, a sack outlet, and some Disciple of the Vaults. The exact way the combo works doesn't really matter, as long as you're able to win off of casting Flash. This combination of cards is so cheap and so good at its job that you can even win the game on turn zero with the right hand. That's right, you begin the game, your opponent begins their upkeep, and you go, let me stop you right there, and win the game before they even play their first land. This, unsurprisingly, has led to Flash to being banned in Legacy for a long time. It's also banned in Commander, but it didn't used to be. For a long time, Hulk was the banned card in the format, and eventually it was taken off because the rules committee figured that it couldn't be that bad if the card came back. Cut to months of Flash Hulk being the only playable deck in CEDH, and the competitive community begged for the rules community to ban Flash so they could try hard in peace. Flash is about as banned as Channel is across Magic's many formats, so it's a bit of a toss-up as to which one is the more broken card. Flash being the less risky and ultimately less high investment combo is what puts it on this list, though Channel certainly isn't far behind. Not to mention that Flash's brief stint to playability in Commander means that it's done a lot more recently than Channel has. Either way you look at it, Flash is definitely one of the most broken cards in Magic, and one of the few ways to win the game without even taking a single turn. Alright, and that's the video. Are there new cards you think may have missed, or have any ideas for future videos just like this one? 
If so, let us know down in the comments.